All right, welcome everyone. So this is week 11, March 25th, and this is the level one recording for lessons for full spectrum humans. Last week's technical difficulties prevented me from being able to record or participate effectively. And so this week, everything is going to go much more smoothly. I'm just muting um, anyone other than me, not because I don't love you, but just in order to keep the sound from reverberating. And the topic for level one, this hour I'm splitting into two segments. The first one is the fateful how to flying rainbow lasagna, the verb. And the second is the material that you see prepared behind me, all about the flower of life and how that relates to the flying rainbow lasagna. And this is important stuff because you'll see the flower of life in a lot of um, higher consciousness artwork or articles, or sometimes people just like slap it on a pair of yoga pants to make it look cool. And it's being used in a, in a lot of ways that are not necessarily conscious. You know, kind of like if someone just put the um, equation E equals MC squared on their t-shirt, but they don't really know what it's all about. So the flower of life is actually about, um, if we do it right, us turning into higher dimensional beings, but the way it's currently being taught is very flat. So we'll get into that second segment. The first thing is I really wanted to um, talk all about and make clear the concept of the flying rainbow lasagna as a verb or as an energetic maneuver that one may perform with your energy, consciousness, and system of perception. So this is an exercise or a maneuver that we do not necessarily perform with our physical structure, like doing a push-up or a pull-up, but it has an impact on the genetic level when you begin to do this. And the first thing is, it's crucial to just have an understanding of what the singularity is. In order to perform these mental or consciousness maneuvers, we have to establish understanding of certain crucial concepts. And this is the concept of the singularity. Even by definition, we are saying that this is a single item. There cannot be more than one singularity. And, what, and I'll also define terms because science defines the singularity and then there's the singularity in the way that I am using it. So science defines a singularity as essentially what is at the center of a black hole. If we were to take the super stretchy fabric of the universe and put an infinitely heavy bowling ball on top of it, as we began to stretch that fabric of space, time and consciousness endlessly, at the point is where we get the singularity. Here we go. Welcome to everyone who's just joined in. I'm just making sure that everyone is muted so I don't get feedback. Let's see if my program will cooperate with me. And things are going good. Hold on a minute. So according to science, the singularity is what is at the center of a black hole. Um, science also recognizes and describes the singularity as what existed before the theoretical Big Bang. And we do have to understand that the Big Bang is a theory and not something that we should just take as cosmological fact, but it is the story of this current time and place that describes how we got here and it is held by held aloft by our current version of, you know, scientist priests, the people who run the observatories and tell us what's going on. So the this is the concept of before the Big Bang, the idea that we have an endlessly expanding universe. We had all material, all energy and all consciousness collapsed down into one super, super dense place. And this is the place that is the presence of all energy, all timelines, all possibilities, and all probabilities. And so science recognizes that description of a singularity and then imagines that the Big Bang or the, the uh, universe that we see around us is a result of that dense consciousness 
spontaneously beginning to expand and creating time and creating all the elements that we're experiencing here, including material matter. And where science's definition of the singularity and my definition overlap or coincide is the idea that the singularity is where all of the rules break down. Because according to science, like once you have the presence of total energy, all of the equations don't make sense anymore. So um, uh, the equations that govern sensibly the rest of the world do not apply sensibly in the realm of the singularity. And so my understanding of the singularity is that it is this point at the center of each one of our chakras that we have these vortexes of energy that all converge from different directions on the same place. And this is um, a story and an allegory about consciousness and about our lives because each one of us has a singular many singularities within us. So it's like saying, I have a doorway within me, you have a doorway within you, 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 but all of those doorways lead to the same room. They all go to the same place or they all converge at the same level of consciousness. We can understand this by understanding that um, parallel lines meet at infinity, you know, lines going off into the, the distance in perspective. All of our lines meet at infinity. And we can also understand this that there is a singularity inside of every single cell on your body. And I have pictures of cells back here. So your singularity is your connection to infinity. Each cell within its nucleus has a connection to infinity. Each one of your chakras has a connection to infinity, connection point right in there to infinity. The planet that we're living on or living concurrently with right now has a connection to infinity inside of her. The star, Sol, that we're currently circulating around has a connection to infinity inside of it. And even our entire galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, and there is a connection to infinity in there. So these are all fractal microscopic um, patterns. The giant Milky Way has a tiny doorway at its center, and the giant sun has a tiny doorway at its center, and the giant planet has a tiny doorway at its center. And even a human, a macroscopic human, has a tiny doorway at its center and each cell that makes up our body has a tiny doorway to infinity at its center. Understanding this and embodying this truth is what allows you to perform the flying rainbow lasagna maneuver, which is essentially when you combine the doorway to infinity or the singularity that is inside of you with the doorway to infinity or the singularity that is inside of any other thing, any other a person or a star or a planet or a consciousness or an entity or even um, an abstraction such as, um, you know, the building that houses uh, Congress or Parliament. You can fly in rainbow lasagna with the House of Parliament. Can you believe that? And what that would mean is, and I say this because I have flying rainbow lasagna with Capitol Hill. And when I did that, I combined the singularity that is within me and the singularity that is within that, let's say, representative governing body. And just one moment. Sorry about that interruption. And what happens when you perform this maneuver is you become um, powerful. The ex you expand the realm of what you are powerful. Uh, let me start again. You expand your own realm of power by expanding your identity. So if I perform the flying rainbow lasagna maneuver 
with something else. I'm looking at a house plant right now, myself and this house plant. If I do that, I combine my essence with that plant, that individual entity. I'm going back in here because you are students of this class and we've been over this many times. The idea of duality, of separation, of ego. Remember, we did that in a couple of lessons ago. The um, creation of a sense of individuation and self and ego that is usually created, you know, in early childhood or infancy, and that that's a separation from the rest of the world, just like there is a cell membrane point with my pointer over here. The cell membrane forms a separation of the goo that's inside of the cell versus the goo that's outside of the cell. Inside of the cell, it is the intracellular substance, and outside of the cell, it is the extracellular fluid or substance. So this is all about boundaries. And I've described in previous lessons how the flying rainbow lasagna um, integrates the two previously separated areas that are created by a boundary. So if my little pinky fingertip here was a little ant and I was walking on this upper or outer surface of the lasagna, if we arbitrarily define any surface of this lasagna shape that faces the room that we're in as the outer and any surface that faces the inside of the sculpture as the inner. And if I'm a little ant, I'm walking on the outside. I'm trying to tilt it so that you can see it properly in the camera. I'm on the outside here. And even though I'm still walking and I haven't changed pace, now I'm on the inside. I'm on the inside lip. And now I'm back to the outside lip. And now I'm back to the inside lip. Much in the same way that a Mobius strip has incongruously or impossibly only one side the flying rainbow lasagna combines the inside and the outside, or what's on the inside of the cell with, with what's on the outside of the cell, or it combines what's in Aurora with what's outside of Aurora. And what's outside of Aurora can be any focal point. It could be this beautiful house plant that inspires me on my desk, it could be the sun, it could be the planet, it could be my cat, it could be, and when I said that I flying rainbow lasagna with Capitol Hill, it could be the um, abstraction of, you know, government or the ruling body. You can flying rainbow lasagna with an abstract concept or consciousness. And when you do that, it means that you are combining essences. I just need to drink some water. According to interdimensional ethics, you're not allowed to just float on down to wherever you want and wave your magic wand and poof, make people do what you want to do or live the way you want to live. This is the story of why I am here as a walk-in. If I could have accomplished what I needed to accomplish from sitting in a cloud, sitting on a cloud in hyperspace and just, you know, waving my magic wand and, you know, sending energy down, I would have done that, of course, but I had to incarnate and be in the first person in order to be effective and to have power in this realm. The idea is interdimensional ethics. You're not allowed to just impose your will on other people in a realm that you don't occupy. If you need to change something in a realm, you have to go there and occupy that realm. Or another way of saying it is that if you don't live in France, why should you vote on things that affect the French people? The French should vote on the aspects of life that affect them. And you should vote on the aspects of life that affect you. But of course, if you move to France, you then have a vested interest. And that's my experience of being here in the physical realm and on Earth in particular, that I am a uh, emigrant and I have a vested interest in the culture that I have come and submerged myself in. So um, in combining essences with anything, you become that thing and you then have the ethical consideration to impose your will upon that thing. 
it's not unconditionally loving to impose your will upon other beings. It is unconditionally loving to accept other beings and their behavior because that's part of their life trajectory and what they need in order to learn. However, you don't have to have other people learn their life lessons violently all over you. It's absolutely appropriate for you to say, I see that you're going over a cliff and I don't want to be a part of that. So now let's say this. Let's say that I, as Aurora, look at the policies and uh, life decision making that Capitol Hill or the governing body is making, and I don't approve. I see those uh, aspects as going over a cliff, and I'm going to get the blowback because they're making policy on a planet and in a country that I live in, and I'm going to feel the negative effects of it. So it is totally appropriate for me to flying rainbow lasagna with those beings or with that abstraction of government and to say, I combine the singularity inside of me with the singularity that is in that other entity. And when I do that, I then get to have an input into their belief system, structure, and, and behavior and the way that they are uh, living and expressing their truth. Otherwise, it would not be appropriate you are a sovereign being like it's not right for me to tell you what to eat or how to live but if you are starting to affect me in what you're doing then it is appropriate for me to start to tell you how to live and uh, you know what's the right way to be so now i've got a few more minutes i will give you the one two three how to version and there is also a recorded meditation on youtube that's called how to FRL with the sun. And this is my daily practice, all right? So first of all, if a person sees me doing my sun gazing and doing my FRL um, meditation with the sun, they might not think that I'm doing anything. You might just think that I'm either looking at the sun with my eyes kind of closed or most, mostly closed, or I also use a hat because you don't want to burn out your actual retinas. So it's very effective to either use the brim of a hat or let the sun shine through a relatively open weave. And that allows the right amount of sunlight to get to your physical eyes. But all of the light that is necessary gets to your non-physical eye, whether you are wearing a hat or not. So I get into sun gazing. We have a, a lesson all about this, but in safe sun gazing practices, you do not stare at the sun with your physical eyes. So if the sun were, let's say, the camera that is at the top of my screen here, uh, my physical eyes would be focused at the bottom of my screen and my forehead would be aligned with that camera, all right? So you get a sense that I am not using my physical body, I'm using my non-physical apparatus. So the first thing that I do to flying rainbow lasagna with the sun is I sit comfortably. For me, that's sitting with my legs crossed, quote unquote, Indian style or Native American style. And um, I don't actually sit on the ground because it's wet and muddy but I envision that the base of my spine or you know my pelvic bone is connected to Earth's core. And the other aspect of myself is my um, forehead, my brow chakra and my crown chakra. And I envision that those are connected to the sun. So we are creating a complete circuit. And bookmark that idea, creating a complete circuit with the sun. That's gonna come up on level two with what we're talking about. When I perform this circuit with the sun, I then begin to breathe in. And as I breathe in, I'm filling up my lower belly, what is called in the Far East, your hara or ara. It is like the lower where your guts are, there is a reservoir of energy. So breathing in, just like if I had a drinking glass, you fill up a drinking glass from the bottom up. So we fill up our chakras from the bottom up. First, your lower chakras, your hara, your belly, and then another inhalation. And at that point, I'm filling up like my solar plexus, the area below my diaphragm. Another inhalation, and then I have filled up my chest. And at that point, your chest should be lifted and expanded. And you could even imagine pulling back your shoulder blades. And then the final breath, 
I bring that energy all the way up through my sinuses, all the way circulating up here. And if I do it right, out through, here we go, out through the top of my head. But it doesn't just go out, it circulates back around into the back of my head and then circulates forward again. Or circulates back into my spine and comes out through my heart, okay? And as I'm doing this, I envision the singularity jumping or oscillating back and forth between myself and the sun. So I'm using a lot of words to describe this, but that's like if I were to describe the cha-cha to you in words, like move your left foot, move your right foot, move your pelvis, move your buttocks. Like it's very different when you're actually doing it. I'm using a lot of words to describe this, but when you actually do it, you'll feel it. So what I do is I have created my energy circuit, a deep breath in, and then I send the singularity to the sun. And so the first little half cone is my half cone, and then this jumps to the sun, and then the next half cone is the one that is facing the sun. And then that little singularity jumps back to me, and I make this, uh, here, I'm trying to make it on camera, this lower half cone, you know what I'm talking about, and then it jumps back to the sun, and we make this upper cone. So what we're constantly doing is doing lower cone, upper cone, lower cone, upper cone. So it is the singularity in me and the singularity in the sun. The single, here, oh, this is good. This one that's pointing towards me. The singularity that's in me, the singularity that's in the sun. The singularity that's in me, the singularity that's in the sun. In me, in the sun. In me, in the sun, and then in me. So let's count. How many times do we do this oscillation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight lobes of the lasagna, and we make the little singularity jump back and forth eight times between yourself and whatever it is that you are combining your essence with. So I'm your teacher, and when I say um, that this should be done, from a state of unconditional love, all right? Um, I couldn't even imagine how you would flying rainbow lasagna some with someone in anger, but that is not how we do this. This can be intimidating though, because this is like, imagine someone who's got a really clear, sharp voice, and they're, when they sing a note, it's like, like their note is right on target and they're very loud. And what if, you know, you're singing next to that person and you're not quite on tune. You're not quite in uh, at the exact frequency you're supposed to be. So um, the flying rainbow lasagna maneuver might be intimidating to beings that are not coherent or very um, loud, like they haven't amplified their own vibration, that they might be afraid of being swamped or overwhelmed by whatever you are um, placing on them. This is what I found. But this is not a system for dominating or controlling anyone, is what I'm trying to say. Like, this is not like a gun. Like, you'd better do what I want you to do, otherwise I'm going to flying rainbow lasagna you. Like, it's not like that. And even the concept of it is unimaginable because of where this came from and the way that it was created. In a lot of ways, the flying rainbow lasagna is a weapon in the same way that an idea can be a weapon or that the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, ideas and concepts, especially ones which lead to individual sovereignty, like this is your key to freedom to making your own life choices and exerting your own will and steering your own life trajectory as opposed to having lower vibrational negative service to self entities steer your trajectory for you, which is what we'll get into in level two. So it is a weapon in the sense that this makes humanity no longer have to be pushovers. You no longer have to be victims or passive experiencers of a scenario that is not of your cre creating and that is not comfortable to you. You now can be artists of 
reality. But, and when we are artists, and let me show you, this is the paintbrush of reality. When you are using your pineal gland to paint reality, you must do it from a state of unconditional love. So for example, let's use uh, combining with Congress, a flying rainbow lasagna with the governing body. Why did I do that? First of all, because it, it was ethical for me to do so. They were making decisions that were going to have an impact upon me, and I felt that they were faulty decisions. It's not the type of thing where it would be like, oh, I'm sure that'll be okay. Decisions that were not going to be okay, and that would have had a negative impact on me. And when I flying rainbow lasagna with them, they essentially became like, like if you're like a mama bird and you have all of those little baby birds are kind of underneath your feathers. And when they are in that realm, they are being influenced by you. And my, my voice, my tone is very clear. My connection to source is very clear. And this is a guiding vibration or a guiding harmonic tone that sets people in alignment. So when I flying rainbow lasagna with the Congress, they all got in tune with the note that they're supposed to be singing. And so this is the ideal way that we create. Um, it is not like saying um, you're bad and wrong and I, agree with, I disagree with you on every level. It's like saying, I see mistakes are being made and I would like to be empowered to prevent those mistakes. When I fly rainbow lasagna with the sun, the sun is a much louder and more perfect singer than I am. And so I um, am more influenced by the sun's vibration than I am the influencer. I hope that this is making sense. Like if you are a very strong vibration, you will be more influencing someone else than if you are um, not that powerful. If your voice is not very loud, you will be more influenced. So um, I hope that this has made sense. Questions or comments. I'm going to open the floor to questions or comments about how to flying rainbow lasagna. And I'm going to unmute everyone, except I'm going to mute. Oh, no, Ed's not a problem. Here we go. Questions or comments about the verb flying rainbow lasagna? Okay. Um, Mike says this could be a way of voting. And I like that. This is very good. Okay, if there aren't any specific questions about anything that I can um, teach you about that maneuver, then I'm gonna move on to, that was last question. week's. Okay, Lucy's here with a question. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Um, can anybody flying lasagna, rainbow lasagna anybody they want? Yes, you can. That's like and saying- And people can do it to us? Anybody- I mean, we know if it's being done. Yes, you would. This is another form of uh, like psychic or telepathic contact or energetic contact. So guess what? We are all always energetically contacting other people all the time. Like when you read somebody's book or you read somebody's Facebook post and then you think about them, you are actually connecting with them on an energetic level when you if a person has been mean to you and if you have you know those endless conversations and it feels like you're talking to them and having a whole big conversation in your head you're connecting with them on an energetic level here's another one if there's a musician whom you really admire and you listen to their music all the time you're connecting with them on an energetic level here's another one and i have a lesson all recorded about this but if you are interested in pornography and you fantasize about particular people while you're engaged in sexual practices you are energetically connecting with those people. Yeah, because our minds attenuate. We reach out with our consciousness. This is attention, attention attenuates. And whatever you reach out towards, you are connecting to. So, yeah. the, and the next aspect of your question is, do you know when someone is connecting with you? So my answer is that really depends. 
Um, in other years when I ran the class, sometimes uh, like a student would get in touch with me and they would say, I connected with you in meditation and that was so amazing. And I would say, I'm sorry, I don't have a conscious memory of that because you were connecting with my energy and I wasn't actually there in my daily waking consciousness as Aurora during that uh, exchange, during that conversation. It's more like you were having in um, conversation with my energy or with, with the template of who I am. And I didn't necessarily know that that person was talking to my energy template. So we're constantly, we have like tendrils, kind of like uh, octopus tendrils that go into another dimension. And they're constantly touching other people and being touched by other people. And this is also part of boundaries and being respectful, right? So. Here's how you safeguard yourself. Send out respectful tendrils and do not allow others to insert their tendrils into you disrespectfully. So if someone who is an unwanted presence comes to me, um, then I would, you know, I basically say no thank you or my Merkaba shield would keep them out. I'm trying to think of a good example, but I'm just not. Oh, I have a very good example. A person who I was in a feud with years ago in Woodstock regarding a studio space that I had, but they wanted. And at night before I would fall asleep, I often felt that they were trying to come to me and like attack me in my mind and that they were like reaching into my mind. And at the same time in the physical realm, my studio sign was mysteriously stolen and a few other little things went missing. That was kind of like, hmm, I think this is some, someone's targeting me here. So, and eventually what I did in meditation was I went into that person's mind and I essentially said, this is not okay and you have to stop doing this to me because here's the thing with bullies and we'll get into this with level two also. You think that bullies will just stop if you ignore them. You think that if you just sit there like, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to be very zen and I'm not going to do anything. And the bullies keep hammering away. And the bullies don't actually stop until you either stop their fist or until they actually get punched in the face. And then they say, oh, I didn't like being punched in the face. So I'm now going to stop punching you in the face. But um, we'll, we'll get into that on lesson two. The, the real answer, Lucy, is that this should be done um, from a state of unconditional love or let's say with um, the highest motivations that the fly, it's like making love or an artistic collaboration. And when I imposed the flying rainbow lasagna upon Congress, it was not meant to be something like a mind rape or anything like that but it is meant to be um you're allowed to express yourself here in the chorus or the symphony of the world you have a right to express yourself because there are many other beings that are also expressing their themselves there are beings that are unconscious that are expressing chaos or negativity or anxiety you know they're constantly like you know sending off a lot of um, uh, non-coherent waves. And then there are people who are also really evil and they have a negative intent and they're also sending off their vibration. And if you are here and you have a positive intent, then it is absolutely your right. It's your role in the grand scheme of things to send off your vibration. And the flying rainbow lasagna is a tool that allows you as an individual to send off your vibration very effectively. So, all right, question from Mike. Question says, does doing the FRL gain energy for us the same as we get from food? The answer is yes. When you combine, well, it depends on what you're combining with, but I find that when I, do the FRL with the sun, I get way more energy because I'm combining with a much larger, higher vibration entity. When I combined with Congress, that was more like work because I was combining with a lot of lower vibrational beings or I was the strongest singer in that choir. So I would really say the answer is, um, it depends on who you're combining with and combine with planets and stars. Like they are the, beings that we wish to be um, 
cultivating the consciousness with co combining our consciousness with and learning from and mostly other humans are not that stellar to combine your consciousness with i would like to move on to the flower of life information are you guys cool if i do that uh -huh. okay so i'm going to mute the audio just so that i don't have a problem with reverb on the recording Cool. All right. And I'm also going to get started on the recording of the EduCreations thing in the background. What have I got here for you guys? This is the lesson 11 stuff. And I do recommend that you watch the recorded homework lesson because it goes, it delves deep into how the flower of life is made. Like this is the, you know,